Hello. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Youth Zone. Um, I'm Jill Morrison, I am the work for the Secretariat of the Net Zero All Party Parliamentary Group. Um, we're really delighted to have the one and only Alok Sharma, who's got a lot on his plate uh, on Net Zero. And of course, uh, Stanley Johnson, who may not need much of an introduction, but uh, he's very active, uh, an international environmental ambassador. Uh, of course, the father of somebody called Boris, um, and uh, also um, for the Conservative Environment Network. Um, so I'm just feeling, because we're waiting for Katie Balls from The Spectator to come and ask you some tricky questions and have an in, in conversation. But I wanted you, uh, just obviously we're in the youth zone and we've got some very young people in the front row. I'm not one of them, but. <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the questions and one of the things that we're doing in the, ahead of COP26 is launching Generation Zero um, about the, the young people and their contribution because they will be the people who are around in 2050 and they will go carry forward, I think, uh, that great commitment to net zero. So there'll be more uh, about that. Um, I think I've filled the gap uh, whilst the wonderful Katie Balls has arrived. So I'll, I'll shut up there and, um, you know, support the all-party parliamentary group. Um, we're all about accelerating and embedding net zero policies. So that's enough for me. And over to you, Katie. Great. Is this working? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, you may have already had the introduction, but um, welcome to the Net Zero APPG today, uh, brought to you by Centrica. Um, and we're going to have, I think, quite a brief conversation, but packed with insight and really giving you everything you need for the minutes we have um, with Alec Sharma and Stanley Johnson. Now, I don't think they need much introduction. Alec Sharma, COP26 president, uh, the man in charge of the summit in November, where pressure is building, but I'm sure I'm just going to bounce off of you, Alec, and um, it'll be a, a great success. And then we have Stanley Johnson, international ambassador of the Conservative Environment Network. Um, I thought just to begin, um, I'll just get you know a, a minute or two each from you um, about why it is that you know you believe the net zero agenda is so important and what you think you know the biggest challenge at this point is so let me just stand up for that um uh, firstly it's great to see uh, uh lots of people here and also some of the faces i recognize from other events that i've done today so i promise you i'm not changing the message and you're here to check that i'm not um look we know that uh, we are currently, and the science tells us, that we are at 1.1 degree of warming above pre-industrial levels. It doesn't sound like much, but actually you see the impact of this around the world. The flooding in China, in Europe, the wildfires in California, in Australia, you've seen uh, in, uh, in Siberia, uh, heat waves. So the reality is that every fraction of a degree makes a difference. 
and that is why we want, as part of the COP agenda, for the world to commit to net zero by the middle of the century. And the reality is that this isn't just about creating a cleaner environment, healthier lives for people. This is also about growing the economy. So if I tell you a key statistic, which is that over the last 30 years, we in the United Kingdom have grown our economy by almost 80% and cut emissions by 40%, it shows you what can be done. And therefore, my uh, sort of very clear view, and actually there are lots of countries around the world that see us as uh, leading on this agenda, my view is that we've got to get to grips with this, we can create jobs, we can create industries of the future, and we can ensure that what we are not doing is getting to a point where the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. Great. Now, Stanley, can we have a few words from you? Um, you clearly have you know, a, a reputation as a long-time environmentalist and are often credited uh, for influencing your son on the matter too. So it'd be great to hear um, you know, why you now think this is a, you know, such an important item. Well. Yeah, I think, I think it's... Hello? Yes. I almost knocked my teeth out then, actually. <laughs> <laughs> good start. That's, that will get us headlines. That's good. I feel like I've got a bleeding lip. <laughs> yeah. Well, the point about... The only reason you call me a long-term environmentalist is with a polite way of saying I'm very old. No. That's the point, Katie. Um, <laughs> well, it is true I am very old. I mean, if you think about it, and really, relatively speaking, when I, when I you know, started thinking about things, average life expectancy taking the world as a whole, was about 30. You know, and, and now it's shot up to, I think, probably, probably 60, 60, well, maybe not as much as 60, but taking the world as a whole. Yeah, and so I did start thinking about this a very long time ago, and, and just very quickly, I mean, yeah, so the summit in, the first Earth Summit, I'm trying to think of anybody here who might have been you know, at that Earth Summit as well as me. I'm talking about... 1972. Any hands? Any hands up? Anybody who was in Stockholm in 1972? Cleo. <laughs> I think yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm not sure the the youth zone is the right place. For <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, but talking about that though, you see, youth was absolutely there. I mean, the point about the point about Stockholm in mid June. Okay, can anybody think of any particular exciting thing about Stockholm in mid-June? Okay, the sun almost never sets. Do you see, it is supremely beautiful, wonderful old, I guess almost medieval buildings, some of them, and there we all were thinking we were going to save the world. We were, there was a wonderful fellow called Maurice Strong, who was the, he was the, as it were, the Alok Sharma of the, you know, of the 1970 conference. The, the world is going to go down in history. You are going to be there, Alok, you know, as successor to, to, to Maurice Strong because what he did in 1972 was mobilize the world on the first environmental summit. We, we, we chanted, save the whale. I can remember it now, save the whale. There was a huge blown up Leviathan which almost could hardly negotiate the streets of the old town. It was so large. Well, actually, what happened, there's a lesson here. So, Stockholm in 1977-79 passes the general program of action, which includes, and we shall save the well. Bear in mind that the UN can pass any number of things, but unless these get translated into legally binding commitments, nothing happens. So, what happened on the whale front? 79, it wasn't until 10 years later that the International Whaling Commission actually brought in the first whaling ban. And then, of course, there were lots of loopholes. What do you have to remember about international law? There are always lots of loopholes. And one of the crucial, crucial loopholes, as far as the whaling ban was concerned, was that our Japanese friends decided they wanted to go on whaling under what's called the scientific exemption. I'm moving very quickly ahead, Katie. I know you want to move this quickly on. That is the point I'm making at. Of course, it takes a long time. So we went from 1992, which was the, which was the, the, the year in Rio, 20 years after Stockholm, they adopted the Climate Change Convention. It took until 2015, which I can't do the math, but I bet there's some people here. Actually, I did Countdown this week with a very, very clever lady who did all the maths. 
Um, and I did all the difficult, difficult words in the corner. I won't say one of the words which I, which I got, because it's a very rude word. And, and, Anne, and Anne Robinson almost just allowed it. Um, <laughs> I might tell Katie quietly later. Okay, um, then I'll tell everyone. Now, where, where, where did I got to? I'm going to finish this one off. It takes a very long time. That is the point I'm making. And what happened was that when we didn't get anywhere by 2009, which was the, te the time it almost all came unstuck in Copenhagen, it was because the leaders of the world suddenly realized you can't actually say, this is what we're going to do, and all you people are going to do it. The targets have to come from public opinion, from national governments who come up with their own, own, own plans. And why do national governments in democracies, I'm making, making clear that I'm talking about democracy, why do they do that? They do that because the people of the world push them to do that. And above all, the young people push them. Don't let anybody tell you that Greta Thunberg is not a star of our time. She is a star of our time. And how Greta Thunberg wasn't given the Nobel Peace Prize, I cannot conceivably imagine. I mean, it just escapes my comprehension. Well, here we are. Now, happily, democracy intervened. The nations of the world realized they have to come forward with what's called bottom-up. Now, I, I, I'm not trying to be rude here, but bottom-up <laughs> bottom is better than top-down. Anyway, and they have come up with bottom-up, and Alex has just told you that with any luck, these national programs, they're called nationally determined contributions, NDCs, are going to be tweaked and more than tweaked, pummeled, pummeled into a new configuration so that by the time we come out of Glasgow, we are headed back on track, not possibly for the degree right. 1.5, but at least for, say, I don't know, certainly less than two. Thank you, Katie. Was I too long? No, that was perfect, right. perfect. Right. <laughs> very, very concise. Um, now, I know Alec has to disappear in a second, but just uh, I wanted to ask you one, one of We've got various suggested questions, but my favorite is, what keeps you awake at night? I think this is in relation to the environment. <laughs> um, and uh, on that, you know, uh, and what single policy change do you think, if you could pick anything, would have the biggest impact right now on behavior, on getting this, you know, uh, the behavioral shift going as we try and get closer to net zero? So the single biggest uh, change that I think we can have is basically consigning coal power to history right around the world. It's something that I've been pushing ever since I took on this role. We've had some success. All the G7 countries signed up in June that they would not finance international coal projects uh, anywhere after this year. South Korea has done the same. I was in China a few weeks ago, and one of the big pushes that we had then was for China to come forward and say no to international coal financing, uh, and that is what they announced. President Xi Jinping announced that at the UN General Assembly just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things. What keeps me awake at night? Uh, well, I'm not sleeping a great deal at the moment, Katie, and I have been in lots of different time zones. I don't know quite what my body clock is doing, uh, but just trying to get this thing over the line. You know, we are, we are literally a month away, less than a month away from COP, and it is about trying to corral all of these countries to come forward, particularly the biggest emitters, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Russia, all of these guys to come forward with ambitious commitments, which they committed to do in Naples at the Climate and Energy Minister's meeting that I took part in, in the communique that came out. So that's what I want to see over the road. And you mentioned China just then, and we hear a lot about the countries which need to up their game on climate. Um, I wondered, uh, on the other side, are there any countries that you think the UK can learn from as you know, examples of you know, good, good habits, uh, places where they've tried something new and it has worked? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, well, firstly to say that, you know, when I go around the world, um, despite what you may sometimes hear in the media, the UK is absolutely regarded as trailblazing when it comes to decarbonizing our power uh, sector, when it comes to creating green jobs. Uh, and I can tell you from my time when I was business secretary, uh, uh, we, we have already started discussing with developing nations about how we can support them to make that green energy transition and how we can support them in explaining how you can have revenue mechanisms to get private sector money in. And that, I think, is uh, uh, really important. And so what was the second point you were saying? Yeah, just what countries do you think perhaps we can learn from? Yeah, so what from? countries can we, can we learn from? Well, I mean, uh, take a country like Denmark. Uh, you know, we've now got the biggest offshore wind sector in the world. I mean, literally in the world, bigger than China. We're going to quadruple that. But a country like Denmark was at the starting point when it came to uh, offshore wind, uh, onshore wind. 
And one of the things that they did was to develop a industry in Denmark to build uh, turbines, to win, uh, build uh, uh, blades. And that is what we are now doing ourselves, right? The company's just invested in two offshore wind uh, 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 hubs, uh, one in Humberside, one in Teesside. Uh, and we've got people like G Renewables going to be building these products in the UK. That's how we go green, we create jobs, and we expand the economy. Brilliant. I know you're, you're in a hurry, Adok, so, um, but just to Stanley briefly, uh, same, same to you, what keeps you awake at night and also what countries can we learn from? <laughs> Keeping on to, the, on to the last one. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm quite as, as dedicated as, as Alok is to the notion that we, we must keep on growing. I mean, years ago, way back in 1970, I wrote a book called The Politics of the Environment, which had a chapter at the end which said, actually, what we need is a stable population, stable economic growth, because if you have a stable population, stable growth, everybody has enough. You see what I mean? Now, the point I meant about the country. Well, I was in Bhutan not, not so long ago, and the extraordinary thing about Bhutan, it actually reached net zero quite a long time ago and is now net carbon positive. Now, of course, there's some advantages. They've got to have lots of hills and so on and so forth. But the other thing they had, you see, the, the, the brilliant, I went to tell you his whole name, because it's a very, very complicated name, which is Nang, Nyingma Jagmik Kumil, something or other, um, that he's the king. And I went to his coronation, which is the reason I was there. OK, he said, actually, what we want is not gross GNP, but gross national happiness. Do you see, and gross national happiness can quite easily be you know, combined with you know, carbon net zero. So I may by be diverging just really slightly from you know, traditional Tory philosophy which says we want more and more growth. We only need more and more growth if we have a more and more expanding population. We can manage to have a stable population. We can perhaps be content with less. Thank you, Tracy. Brilliant, thank you. Now, my panel, until my panel stand up, I'm going to keep going. So. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, so um, ju just so uh, friends here know is that Stanley and I are going to do a double act at 16.50 on the main stage. And if you're enjoying this, it's going to be great fun. Uh, yeah. So come across. But I'll do one more question, then we must go back to prepare. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so I think the... the I think one of the things when talking about net zero is, you know, there's also biodiversity, which is a big part of this. Um, and I, I wondered, you know, do you think net zero by 2050 goes enough when it comes to immediate threats to biodiversity? We've all seen those haunting, you know, images in various David Attenborough documentaries and others um, of the quite immediate damage that the world. Yeah, so I mean, Stanley's uh, actually an expert on all of this. Uh, he, he should also answer this, but just very quickly to say, that um, climate change and biodiversity loss are effectively two sides of the same coin. And that is why in our integrated review that we put out last year, looking at, at foreign policy, we said that our top international priority is to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss. And there's a lot that the UK is doing on this. There's a lot of stuff in the Environment Bill, which uh, I think uh, Stanley may want to just mention. Um, but just to say that there will be a big focus on nature at, uh, at COP. And you know, the Prime Minister is very invested in this particular issue, uh, I suspect partly because who his father is, I don't know. Uh, but uh, this is, this is a, a, a big, big issue that we will also seek to tackle uh, in Glasgow. Well, I want to say the Prime Minister actually promised to give me some beavers for my 80th birthday um, <laughs> down on the farm in Somerset. It's trying to be slightly more complicated because the government haven't yet authorised the release of beavers you know, to, to Wild River, so he actually arrived with a beaver skin instead. Anyway, that's, that, that's, that's, bes that's beside the point. Where were we? Oh, yeah. The general point about biodiversity, incredibly important. Thank you, Alok, for saying that. And let us just remember, you see, th there's a trap in this net carbon zero by 2050. People say, oh, well, 2050. Well, 2050, that's a long way away. God, we got lots of time. No, the crucial thing is how you get to 2050. And that is why the crucial thing is what happens by 2030. It, it, that is really you know, it, 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 totally, totally vital. And so that is why the targets, which are now in the UK's environment bill, now, they're not yet in law, because the Environment Bill is not yet law. So there's no point saying, we now have legislated targets. We are intending to legislate a 2030 target for halting and reversing. The actual precise words at the moment are the loss of species abundance. That is important, because the UK is also pushing for the so-called international biodiversity targets. So they don't want to get too technical here. But they succeed the IG 
targets which expired at the end of last year. The international targets, the UK is pushing for those same words, halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity. But we're actually talking in general about biodiversity. Those are the language, that was the language used by the heads of state in, in, in the G7. We want that to be in the international target, too, which is why, again, China is crucial, because China is chairing the so-called Kunming Conference, which is going to happen, guess where? No, any takers? Kunming. John, very smart audience here. Well, you never know where I'm going. I was once a supply teacher at the Oxford Littlemore Northfield Secretary College. My car was so muddy that I came up one day and they said, this is a very muddy car. Anyway, someone had written, at least they could write. They spelled muddy right. Anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, well, uh, with that, I want to thank you very much, Stanley, for your contributions. And I want to thank Alok. Um, we, it was a fairly snappy session, but I think it's safe to say we packed quite a bit in from beaver skins uh, <laughs> to uh, net zero and what we can learn uh, from Denmark. Now, um, I think I would just, um, if the panel needs to stand up, I can, that's fine, I can keep talking. Um, yes. Right, um, I'm going to mention it for you so that you're not embarrassed. This book. <laughs> This is a book written by a guy called Stanley Johnson. He's written lots of great books. And um, the thing with this, it's a thriller. It's a climate thriller. I have read it from cover to cover. And it's one of those books you cannot put down. But just to tell you that this was a book that Stanley wrote in the 1980s. It's pretty rough. Read it. Read it. Buy it. I don't get any royalties. Thank you. And Stanley, will you be doing a signing? Or? Well, yeah, there will be a signing. After our, after our next duet, I think it'll be about 5.15 in the, in the, in the pop-up bookshop. Great. Okay, great. So then we managed to also fit in book plugs to the session, so that's good. Um, so I'd just say thank you um, very much to our panellists. Thank you, everyone, for coming down. And I would just um, add like, you know, it's great to be in a room seeing so many young uh, you know, people present because sometimes when you walk around Conservative Party conference having, you know, this might be my fifth year, it's not what you see the most of. <laughs> it can be a little bit older. And I think it's interesting for the Conservative Party too because we know that um, when it comes to issues that the young people care about, environment is so high up on the agenda and you can see how the Tories can look ahead to the future if they make this a key plank. And I think we can see signs of that in the room today. Um, so thank you very much. Do we need to talk about the competition or... I'll hand you to just to say um, thank you very much, Katie, as well. That was an excellent uh, session. Um, I've talked to some of you earlier. I want to thank Centrica in particular for supporting today uh, the Net Zero APPG. We want to see the young ambassadors and Generation Zero up in Glasgow. Um, so put in your application via your Member of Parliament uh, to say you want to be a Generation Zero ambassador, and that's a commitment to 2050 and ongoing. So you are tomorrow's generation uh, and you, it's about what you can do today. So thank you very much, everybody. And I think it's been a great session. Thanks again, Katie.